All right, we're back after break. And this morning, we're going to hear a little bit about the hospital uh, finances, um, sort of an update and an overview. And we've asked the Green Mountain Care Board in to do that, as well as uh, the Hospital Association. And we're, we're all hearing different things from our own hospitals and also from the, um, the bigger, larger uh, organization. So I think this is important for us to understand, especially now, uh, still, still, still pandemic time. So um, Susan Barrett is here and Lori Perry. I don't know that you've been, Lori, I don't know that you've been in our committee before. Um, presented the expenditure analysis a couple of years ago. Yeah, I, told her, I do remember that. Okay, so welcome back. Well, Thank you. Uh, some new faces, um, Senator Hooker from Rutland County, Senator Hardy from Addison County, Senator Terenzini from Rutland County, and then Senator Cummings is unable to be uh, with us today. Uh, so. Susan, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you introduce yourselves for the record. And then we do have something from you on our webpage. Great. Good morning, Madam Chair and Senate Health and Welfare Committee. My name is Susan Barrett. I'm the Executive Director of the Green Mountain Care Board. I am joined today by my colleague, Lori Perry. And Lori, why don't you just go ahead and introduce yourself for the record? Hi, I'm Lori Perry. I've been with the Green Mountain Care Board since inception, and before that I was with Vishka. And Lori is going to drive the slides. As she's putting those up, I want to extend apologies from Chair Mullen this morning. Uh, we had a board meeting scheduled this morning um, to discuss hospital budget guidance for FY22. So he is there with the rest of the board and with the director of our health systems finance. Um, so I was lucky enough to snag Lori to come along with me to uh, give all of you an update on the financials. What we're going to do today is um, I'm gonna have a little bit of background, but then I think it's going to be very helpful for Lori to go through those numbers with you. And then I know we're going, you're going to hear afterwards from um, Vaz and Devin. Um, I know Lori, are you having a hard time getting the- Yes. Linked up, okay. Sorry. That's okay. We use Teams over at uh, the Green Mountain Care Board, not Zoom, so it's a new system. And I can just start while Lori- Yeah, that's and... great, thank you. Okay. Great, so um, let me just pull this and up. Look up at what, why, don't you, uh, why don't you begin, and we do have the slides on our iPads. Um, it's actually preferred to have them up on the screen, but we'll be able to follow along if you um, got great. us. Great, so on the overview of what I'll share today, we're going to talk about our statutory charge that uh, is in statute and you've given us as it relates to hospital budget oversight. Um, we're gonna talk uh, about the hospital budget guidance, which is currently happening right now in our board meeting um, and look at how we've been able to um, adjust that guidance uh, per Act 91 over the last year and this year. Um, then we'll get into some of the timelines just to give you, I know there are some newer members to the committee, just a high level overview of wh what our summer will look like. It's very exciting. We have a very busy regulatory summer. Um, sometimes that's a, that's a good thing and a bad thing when there's like three weeks of Vermont summer. Um, and then we'll turn it over to Lori and she can get into the FY20 system-wide performance and, and go through some of the numbers. And lastly, we'll round out with an interactive visualization. I want to check in on time, Madam Chair. Um, it, I, we should get through these slides fairly quickly, but I, I want to make sure that uh, I, I wasn't clear how much time I had. Well, we have you and we have Vaz for the next hour. So, okay. So um, we want to make sure that you each have uh, enough time. I think um, 
I think so, that's reasonable. Um, and we'll get we'll get through these and um, be available for questions as we go. Um, okay. So, one I'm second, a, Susan. I'm frozen. I'm going to have to try and get back into the meeting. Okay. It's completely frozen. I'll be right back. Okay. Thanks, Lori. I got it covered for now. <laughs> um, Lori, so, Lori, before you yeah. go, would it be helpful for Nellie to try and put your slides up on the screen? That'd be good. I yeah. just, I still can't even use my mouse or anything to get okay. out of the Let, let's, Well, let's do that. Nellie, do you mind? Can you do that, please? Nellie. Okay. Great. So Thank she, you. I'll be right back. Uh, all right, perfect. Oh. All right, let's go. Okay. So now that we have, so we, we can go to the next slide, Nellie, if you wouldn't mind. Great. Um, so our, stat oh, our statutory charge uh, is annually uh, by October 1, the board has the responsibility to review and establish hospital budgets. In the review, the board looks at local healthcare needs and resources, utilization and quality data, as well as hospital administrative costs and other data. We um, hear presentations from hospitals, we receive input from the healthcare advocate, and we do everything in a public form, as, a, as um, you all know, in our public meeting. And we, of course, accept comments from the public. All of this is what we usually do when we don't have COVID. With COVID, we have adjusted our process, which I will uh, go through in the next slides. So Nellie, the next slide, please. So hospital budget guidance off, um, it, for a quick overview, I won't go in detail on this, but it really starts over uh, several months before we start talking about the guidance at the board meeting. We work um, with VAS and with CFOs. Um, first, we look at the, the finance and the health of the hospitals. We look at um, our internal regulatory alignment and then look at the scheduling, um, and we use our, our data to drive our analytics. Um, then, as I said, we work with VAS and with um, some CFOs from the hospitals, as well as the healthcare advocate in meetings. And when I say we, I should um, specify this is just the staff. The board obviously cannot meet as a whole with any of these entities unless it's a public meeting. So we do this at the staff level. Um, and then internally working with our value-based care teams um, and then start this public process, which we're going through right now, hopefully finalizing our guidance today. Um, and then uh, we issue that guidance and then um, we update the information from um, that process into the narrative for the, for the hospitals to follow. So next slide. When I see Lori's back, that's great. Uh, so this is just an overview of our timeline. I don't have to go through this now, but just so you know, we're right at the very beginning. The guidance will be issued at the end of this month to the hospitals. Uh, this summer, we'll be um, reviewing those budgets that come to us July 1st. As I said, our hearings are also this summer in August. Um, so everyone knows they will be virtual again this year. We didn't want to take a chance of trying to have folks come together. And they actually worked out really well. I think the hospitals um, appreciated the flexibility in terms of travel time uh, that they didn't have to take. And then in September, we issue the decisions. They are due in statute by September 15th. Okay, Nellie, the next slide. So just to summarize um, last year uh, per Act 91, thank you to all of you for your uh, flexibility in terms of our regulation. And I know I, that the hospitals and our other regulated entities appreciated that fast work for, from all of you so that we had the ability to streamline our processes. And these are just some, a summary um, of what we did last year and then on the next slide. So 
we changed the date from July 1st to July 31st, so gave folks an extra month to get the get their submissions ready. Um, we abbreviated many of the Excel templates that were used by each hospital. We eliminated non-financial reporting, and I'll go into a few more details on that on the next slide. We limited questions from uh, the board and the healthcare advocate also limited their questions. And then we added um, information that would help um, identify and highlight the impact of COVID, which is pretty obvious. You'll see it in Lori's slides. Next slide. Th this slide, I won't go through all of it, but I wanted to highlight it because you can see on the left side is the items that are in the, uh, many of these are in the non-financial reporting section of the hospital budget guidance. And you can see the recommendation and the um, result was that we removed or combined many of these items like um, uh, quality reporting, um, capital investment cycle, uh, we were able to, if the last part, the appendices, remove many of those tables that we really felt were, um, you know, this year, last year, and likely this year, just burdensome for the hospitals to provide to us. With that said, we obviously have the um, statutory uh, duty to uh, review these budgets and to make sure that we are receiving critical information at this time. But I just really did wanna highlight that we made a, a, a tremendous effort and thanks to all of you for the ability to do that through our Act 91 flexibility. So the next slide is looking at the guidance that we're reviewing at this moment. And um, again, we, this year we changed the date back to July 1st and the hospitals were fine with that. Um, but we are doing this very similar things that we did last year in terms of removing those non-financial reporting requirements, um, looking at quality, looking at wait times, really important things, but we just, um, these two years we recognize ha have been um, really uh, unlike any other <laughs> for the hospital. So uh, we are streamlining our efforts. Again, we're limiting our questions to those of a technical and clarifying nature. Um, one other thing that is under consideration, again, as we speak is the exemption from the public hearing policy and um, that criteria. And, and ho hopefully we'll have a final vote on that today. But again, that Act 91 um, flexibility allowed us to do that. Okay, next slide. I'm gonna turn it over to Lori now. Um, Madam Chair, do you, should I stop for questions now or have Lori get into the numbers? Um, I have a bunch of questions that I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold them okay. uh, for now and, and maybe even till after the hospitals have uh, testified. Um, so we'll just keep going, I think. Great, thank you. Lori. Okay, we wanted to show you what happened with the hospitals for last year, the first year of the pandemic. So the next slide, we're going to go into fiscal year 2020. And we require the hospitals to send to us in our adaptive software, their operating results for fiscal year 2020. We ask for it for all of their years we also ask them to send us their audited financial statements. And also if they have parent organizations, the audited financial statements for those too. And if you are interested, we have all this information on our website under hospital budget review, um, actual 2020. And you can see the individual hospitals reports and um, audited financial statements and things like that. We also like to make note that Springfield was not able to give us their audited financials for 2020. So we used their preliminary data that they had sent to us last fall for their fiscal year 2020. And you'll see notes on all the slides pretty much about Springfield. Um, next slide, please. 
And we also, um, when we were doing the hospital budget guidance last year in May, the last day the board waived the enforcement for 2020 because of the COVID pandemic. And this is the language of the uh, motion that happened on the 27th board meeting. Uh, next slide, please. So we're gonna show you what the hosp Vermont hospital system has looked like for 2020. And of course that's the Vermont Community Hospitals. It does not include Brattleboro Retreat or the, the Vermont Psychiatric Hospital. Um, on the left-hand side is the Vermont Hospital System Net Patient Revenue and Fixed Perspective Payments, the actual results to their budget. And if you're comparing it to budget, they were um, just shy of $300 million from their budget, um, which is pretty significant. And then, but their operating expenses were 12,000, 12,200 over their budget for 2020. This other um, chart on the other, to the right is showing fiscal year 19 to fiscal year 20 and their net patient revenue fixed perspective payment was less by $163 million, but their operating expenses were $85 million higher than 19. Again, this is all of their pandemic type expenses, PPE, testing, things like that, and um, very significant. We also show it all throughout um, any presentations that we do, we show operating margins. And this is uh, from 2015 through 2020. And they, as you can see, they've been declining. And 2020 was hit very hard because of the pandemic, but also 2020 has the stimulus funds included. And we wanna emphasize that this number might change based on federal guidance on the stimulus funds. So, so can you just stop there for a second? So, I mean, you, you hit a question I was gonna ask, but this is a good time. So the stimulus funds are included in the 2020 data that we've had, the, that they've had so far. That's true, and it's also based on their auditor's guidance. Some okay. are recording it in their uh, profit and loss or income statements, so it'd be showing up in the operating margins, and some have been told not to. So okay. it's all over the board, and so expect this to probably change. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. So um, we can go to the next slide. And the top slide is showing fiscal year 2020 quarterly operating margins. And we would like to see um, the margins with all the hospitals showing just UVM Medical Center and then without UVM Medical Center. And there's uh, quite the um, difference in these particular graphs. Um, we also like to show that because UVM Medical Center has about 50% of the hospital system. And then the bottom slide is showing from 2015 to the 220. Again, operating margins with UVM Medical Center, without UVM Medical Center, and then all the hospitals. It's a very telling slide. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also, when we're looking at the hospitals, we look at their pair mix, of course, um, commercial, Medicare, and Medicaid. And in this slide, we're showing 2018, 19, and 20. And for system-wide, we haven't seen too, too much change from pairs. But when you look at individual hospitals, you will see that they are, have a different pair mix. Some might be 63% commercial, some might be, again, 50% commercial and things like that. So, but this is the system. Um, and it's, it's been consistent for the last few years, even with the COVID. So next slide, please. Um, with the pandemic, the hospitals were having to rely more and more on their other operating revenue. And this is where their COVID funds were reported. So we wanted to show you uh, from year to year, their net patient revenue and fixed perspective payment, and then their other operating revenue and 
what the other operating revenue percentage is as a total of uh, of total operating revenue. So the total graft or bar is their total operating revenue. The light blue is their net patient revenue fixed prospective payment. And the little bit darker blue is the other operating revenue. And for 2020, that is like I mentioned where their CARES Act funding is showing up. And so as we're showing, it's 15.9% of their total operating revenue. And a lot of the, quite a few of the hospitals credited the CARES Act funding was critical to the sustainability of their hospitals. Um, the next slide, please. Another look at the other operating revenue. Um, the slide on the left is just showing the growth in other operating revenue from 2016 to 2020. Um, it just about doubled in 2020. But then the other slide on the right hand slide, we wanted right hand side, excuse me, wanted to show the different categories that the hospitals have that are in their other operating revenues that help support the hospitals. And some of this is um, like outpatient pharmacy revenue for our UVM, specialty pharmacy. There's the 340B retail pharmacy programs. And then the one with just the one bar for COVID stimulus and other grant funding, how much that was for fiscal year 2020. We also want to mention that not all the hospitals were able to uh, recorded all the stimulus funds that they received this last calendar year because this is their fiscal year, which ended in September. So some of the hospitals received some funds like in November or December of 2020, and you will see that show up in their fiscal year 2021. So Lori, I, I just wanna ask a quick question. Uh, you have specialty pharma pharmacy, and then you also have the 340B. Um, so if we, uh, the, if we added those two together, would that show uh, total pharmacy? No, there's no. outpatient pharmacy, specialty pharmacy, okay. there 340B. Well, if we put all of the pharmacy revenues together then, including the outpatient, I forgot to mention that one. This would be the majority, um, mm -hmm. yes. But I think that we've been hearing in the past that sometimes there's pharmacy revenues that are accounted for netted against expenses based on their program for 340B. Um, we have to really tease that out and we haven't done that very well in the last few years. Okay, so uh, the appearance of this as revenue is um, not completely This is not accurate. the revenue that's going in flowing yeah. through the hospital in yes. their net patient revenue. Like for instance, if you're an inpatient if you have, um, if you're a patient in the hospital and need to have pharmacy drugs, we'll say, or administrative, it might not be included in these particular categories. Okay, thank you. These are non-claims, I believe. These are um, arrangements that they also might have with the pharmacies in the area. And, we're, and as, even as of the other day, we were learning more about 340B from one of the hospitals. Okay, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide is showing the operating margins again, and this is the dollar amount, but we wanted to show you each hospital, what happened in their fiscal year 19, what they budgeted for in 20, and then what their actuals came out to be in 20. Um, so you can see the drastic changes from uh, fiscal year 19, they were, having a $20 million uh, operating margin, which was mainly UVM Medical Center. But in 2020, they only realized $3 million because of COVID. So um, the, and if you're wondering about the uh, percentage variances, those are basically just comparing budget to bu budget to actual or actual to actual and some of the calculations don't look the greatest, but that is um, what they came out to be. So like if you're using Mount Scutney and you're starting with a negative 
um, number to a positive, it doesn't always come out that great. Like for instance, an actual, actual is a negative 1,355%, which is so unusual. And then also for budget to actual, it doesn't even want to calculate it. So if you're wondering about some of those figures. Uh, next slide, please. We also look at key indicators for the hospital. It's not just operating margins. We look at days cash on hand, and we want to see that particular indicator growing or increasing every year. We want to see days receivable, and we want to see that indicator decreasing so that they're collecting on their accounts receivable timely. The days payable, you want that to be a decreasing so that they're paying their bills timely. And they, Debt service coverage ratio, you want that to be increasing so that they have more assets and cash available to pay off their debts, mortgages, and things like that. And then you don't want their age of plant to be growing that much. So for instance, you're seeing Grace Cottage at 20 years, you want that to be much less. And um, the day's cash on hand, we wanted to point out is for fiscal year 2020 includes that stimulus fund. So that might be inflated artificially. And that might, I mean, again, that might be changing again based on what the federal guidelines are. Next slide, please. This is, um, we're happy to announce that we have an interactive visualization. It was just launched this last week. You're gonna be the first outside the Green Mount Care Board to see this. And we're very proud of our team for uh, launching this with our, um, we call it the A-team analytics team. And hopefully this, oh, you got to drive on uh, Nelly. Could you click on that link, please? Thank you. I think. It should be able to go to the Green Mountain Care Board. Yeah, website. I think I think I can, we can do it on our iPads or our computers. So it okay. may be showing up, um, but we have it. So we it's recommend got, trying it out. Sure. Um, there's different radio dials, and you'll get a different look. Um, the look that I pasted into this PowerPoint is um, the system income highlights. And you're able to select on different indicators. You can select on different hospitals. You can select on um, the different, uh, do you wanna look at balance sheets? Do you wanna look at income statements? So play around with it. We want your feedback. And um, we're very proud of this information and we'll be updating it with the second quarter of 2021, um, probably in May, April or May. Terrific. Yeah. We will we'll we'll um, we'll spend a little bit of time ourselves just uh, looking at what you've done. It does look pretty impressive to say the least. So if you go to the operating margins, if you do see that as there's some of its drop down menus and some of its radio dials, um, you will see like for UVM Medical Center, their operating margin um, increased in 2021, they received additional stimulus funds that were not recorded in their fiscal year 2020. So things like that you'll see. How do you, how do you, uh, how does the board uh, adjust its thinking around that, um, the, the CARES funding, the additional federal dollars relative to the budget and maybe what appears to be a a lower operating margin, how is that considered? Is that, I mean, Frank, the, the CARES funding theoretically is to cover the needs during the pandemic, but then we're seeing some significant effect of the pandemic on margin. So the, right. the circular question. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And we are um, emphasizing that type of, um, look and that the CARES Act funds is, you know, it's not necessarily going to be flowing into the continuing into 2021. It's not going to continue maybe into 2022. And we have to, it's a fine line. We're, 
we're um, being very careful on our guidance based on that. All right, thank you. Um, I believe we are at the end of our, oh, there's a couple more slides maybe. I think there's just a summary of what's next. Thank you, Lori, that was great. Um, and I'll just, I'll, I'll tick through these quickly. Um, sustainability planning is coming up. We have an update due to you April 1st. So you will see that next week. Um, we just, so everyone knows, we have taken that work in-house, really the hospitals, as you've heard and you will hear it here, I'm sure, is, you know, they're still really bogged down with COVID and now the vaccines. Um, so stay tuned on that continue to move towards value-based care and part of the sustainability planning looks at that. Um, we will work, as I said, and Lori said, with the hospitals as they move through the COVID-19 impacts through the next years. Um, this will continue to have impact. We have transparency work we're doing. We have a work group with our data team and Vaz is involved in that. And then also health, health equity is a, and that is related to our transparency work. Um, I did not say this at the beginning. I will just close in saying that um, we want to recognize uh, the, the work that the hospitals and all of their workers from the cleaners to the nurses, to the doctors, everyone in between um, has done over the last year. And it continues, as I said, the vaccines are they are in the forefront of rolling that out. Um, so thank you. And we can open it up to questions now, or would you like to go to the next presentation? We're open to whatever you'd like. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll stop here for just a, a couple of minutes uh, uh, for questions and, and then uh, we'll move on. But uh, thank you, this is extremely helpful, I can tell you doing a lot of work um, on the budget process during the pandemic. And I, uh, one, of the, one of the questions that we're going to be asking, of course, and one of the reasons that we're looking at this now is to determine if there are any <clears throat> improvements that might be made in the process, uh, just knowing that A, we've got a, a reform process that's going on that does include quality improvement uh, as well as uh, financial um, metrics. And then B, we're, um, we're <laughs> the process that the, that the hospitals go through every year for budget review, I think is, um, is of concern. It is, it, I mean, it begins, let's say it begins on March 31st and then it goes through till September 15th. And it's a, it's a one year process with a lot of input, um, uh, submission dates, um, clarification information. And then this year, obviously with a pandemic or last year, and then going forward, there will be some modifications to, um, that you've demonstrated to us, one of which is on the, if not the elimination of the need for quality, but at least not reporting quality, which sort of counter, counterintuitive when you're thinking about what are we trying to do? So it, it, uh, I have a thousand questions, but I guess to, the one general question would be, how is it that quality metrics will be included on the dashboard for budget evaluation? So as we highlighted last year and the guidance has not been voted on this year, it's, unless it has, as we have sat here, but the, um, it looks, you know, the, the, it looked like the recommendations from staff were to remove, um, for instance, we would ask, waiting times, how long are folks waiting to see a provider? We eliminated that. Um, we, we will continue to work on a way forward. I think the sustainability planning will also be integral to this work and recommendations out of that work in terms of how we may look at the hospital budget process so that it is getting the board 
the correct information and the right information at the time that we need it. Um, in the back of my mind, and, and it's always that Goldilocks point, you know, that sweet spot, like what, what's too much, what's enough, you know, um, not too long ago, pre-pandemic, you know, Kevin and I were in here talking about Springfield and what happened. Um, I, I looked at the chart that Lori showed on the indicators, those arrows, which I love, that was a result of the Springfield experience. And so now we track those. Um, so, so yeah, Madam Chair, absolutely. We will continue to work through this process to make sure that we're, we are doing our due diligence per our statute, but also recognizing that the hospitals acutely are in pandemic mode still. And, and our way forward is to allow them to thrive and sustain in a value-based world. So, um, yes, thank you. I think we all want that to happen. Uh, hospitals are critically important to our healthcare system. Uh, one of the things that we talked about this morning with Commissioner Levine was um, he brought up the health improvement plan and I was glad to hear about it because, at, at, and I think I've mentioned this to you previously, is how the health improvement plan may actually inform the quality metrics for uh, Green Mountain Care Board um, and not to mention the ACO, but just sticking with Green Mountain Care Board. So um, we may be circling back to that as a basis for uh, quality improvement. Absolutely, and we worked very closely. This again was pre-pandemic when we had the luxury of meeting with our colleagues over at the Department of Health. Um, but you look at that, the SHIP, as they call it, State Health Improvement Plan, they were so forward thinking. They were thinking about health equ equity issues way back when nobody, nobody else was talking about it, right? So right. Um, now that we look forward to continuing to work with them and we'll take your lead as you point us. Yes, I, you know, and I think we'll hear from, we're gonna hear for the, from the hospitals in just a minute, but um, just the hospitals are doing um, work to help link um, with community services to, apply, to allow and to uh, provide care management services um, to link primary care, uh, medical home services. So there's a lot going on and we don't wanna lose sight of that, I think. Uh, uh, questions for um, Green Mountain Care Board on the hospital data. Um, Ruth, Senator Hardy. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thanks, Susan and Lori, for being here with us. Um, I had two questions, and that uh, and one is sort of for you and also for Devin when she comes on. But I'm looking at the slide. This is my specific specific question on Vermont hospital system. It's your the the slide about the margins, um, the operating margins, and the declining operating margins from FY15 to FY20. And I'm going to tell you how I'm reading it and see if I'm missing something here. On one hand, um, we want hospitals or any business to have an operating margin so that they have a cushion. Um, to carry forward, but you don't want them to have too much of an operating uh, margin because then their their revenues they're maybe charging too much or you know their their budgets are not accurate. Um, so I see this as both a positive and a disturbing slide um, because we we see the decline, but then it gets to be too low in FY twenty when the pandemic hit and. I'm just wondering, am I interpreting that correctly or am I missing something? So I'll start and I think I, I said this to Lori, we were prepping to talk today. I said, Lori, can you expound on this slide a little bit? And I think I'll, I'll ha have her share what she said to me this morning, but I had the same um, questions. Um, there, again, I think it's the sweet spot, again, that Goldilocks, you know, our job at the board is to 
reduce the cost of healthcare while maintaining access and quality. And if the hospitals don't have that margin to continue to do their good work, that's that's not where we want to go. Um, Lori, I think I'll let you share what the you know the bigger picture and what we've been discussing at the board um, around the expense side of things. So, so before yeah. I want to I want to this is a question that I've had and I did ask it of the hospitals the other day, but. The, the question I would ask is uh, what I think Senator Hardy is getting at is critically important. So what's the floor? You know, what's the floor for the margin based on the, whether it's a critical care access hospital, whatever, whatever it is. And then what's the cap? How, what's, what's too much and what's too little? Right. So, and what, what do we know from our national, from national data? Is there data from uh, hospital types that can help? With that and Lori, I don't know if that's something you can um, briefly touch on as you're answering Senator Hardy's question. Uh, I'll go first with your national information. We don't. We've been trying to find a lot of national information. We're still trying to find benchmarks. We're looking at maybe S and P. We're looking at Kaufman Hall. We want to make it so that it also relates closer to Vermont because we're pretty unique and. We, to also answer the other questions, is that some of the operating margins are basically uh, cause for those particular hospitals having to find their own efficiencies. And also we have, are constantly asking them to try and cut their, their costs as much as possible. But we also realize a critical access hospital has to get reimbursed from Medicare based on their costs. So like yeah. Susan said, there's a sweet spot and we're trying to get it exactly like you said, don't make too much revenue, but make enough to get a margin so that you can funnel the funds back into your organization, um, do improvements on your, your plant, do improvements on your workforce and things like that. But it's like, we are struggling all the time. We're always trying to have it so that we're not having higher um, commercial rates for insurance to support the hospitals, but also we want to have it so that they can survive. Right. Um, some of these hospitals, it's we're seeing it's each individual and we're keeping an eye on each individual hospital to see what's been happening. Some of it is not necessarily just the hospital, it's their organization. Springfield was a good example because um, they had they were associated with their FQHC and having to help with their FQHC. We see other things like that. So it's not just the hospital, but we that's why we're having to a fine line to see just the hospital because that's what we're monitoring. But we also have to know what is the health system that they are supporting. I don't so know that, if that answers the question that, enough. That, that, that very much answers the question, I, or begins to uh, allow for us to look at it. And I think it very much relates to the, the issue of reform that we're talking about, mm -hmm. where we're looking at care management systems, primary care clinics, and then linkages uh, all across the board. So, and how is that measured? So if it's simply measured based on the hospital budget, it doesn't actually measure the entire system of care associated with that hospital. Um, so, and we're, look at, we're in the middle of the pandemic and we know that a lot of what we're, a lot of the reform goals that we have are not gonna be met in the pandemic, but it, the pandemic is highlighting the need for some transition away from the purely hospital budget metric to something broader and more inclusive. So uh, that's our job. I mean, we, we're going to have to look at that as a committee and perhaps make some improvements that will overall help, <laughs> help overall. You know, the, anyway. if, you have, if you were interested in, and it's on our website, is if the hospitals are part, uh, are consolidated with like UVM Health Network. We don't just have UVM. So we have their audited financial statements on our website and you can see the linkages if you were wanted to. So, or other hospitals. Thank you. That's good. 
Go and ahead, I Jennifer. Say, and, and just real quickly, yeah. um, Madam Chair, next, no, this week, I forget which day, one day this week. Friday. Hearing, yeah, thank you. You'll be hearing about four equitable reimbursement report, which also touches on exactly what you're talking about. And I think, Senator Hardy, these questions, um, keep them in mind as you're looking at, at that report as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you for your this information. Um, I just I find that slide just very interesting and one I will certainly keep an eye on. Um, and the, the second question, and I'll ask Devin or Devin can listen and, and answer it in her presentation too is, um, you know, I talked to my hospital a couple weeks ago, my hospital, um, <laughs> hospital in my district, Porter Hospital, um, and, you know, their concerns with the sort of regulatory burdens during the pandemic and uh, totally fair. Um, I get it. And I, what I said to them and uh, is that I, you know, I understand the concerns about the regulatory burden and it sounds like you all have been really sensitive that, to that and trying to reduce the amount of sort of reporting and and things that they have to do um, for their process with you. Um, but I said to them, I don't want two years from now to find out that uh, the hospitals in the same situation as the Springfield Hospital. So it's sort of like your constant Goldilocks. I love the the Goldilocks thing. I'm mean, every time I think about Green Mountain Care Board, the G is now going to be Goldilocks, I think. <laughs> um, so that sort of balance to make sure that there's not too much burden during a pandemic on hospitals and that there's enough oversight to make sure that we're catching the problems because the very last thing I want is in two years to hear that Porter's going under. So, so we, I have monthly re, we have monthly monitor, excuse me, monitoring of these hospitals. Um, we were doing this before the Springfield bankruptcy, but it's definitely emphasized now so that exactly like you said, we're not surprised. And we bring any issues forward to the board um, if we think that there's any problems. Of course, the pandemic is completely different, but we're still reporting. And so you you got a quick look on our interactive visualization of the first quarter of 2021. Okay, so that's sort of an ongoing thing that's outside of the budget process that you're doing. Okay, that's that's right. helpful to know. Great, thank you very much. That's great. Um, so this is good, and uh, this is all extremely helpful. The the other thing that I, the, of course, the margin uh, graph that you gave us slide, graph yes yeah, graph, um, the that you gave us is very informative. Um, it's also informative that um, the Medical Center of Vermont has actually held up some hospitals. It looks like that given the participation in the ACO, we've seen some benefit uh, to some of the smaller hospitals from that larger hospital. And it, 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 it does it does call into question how that gets balanced at the Green Mountain Care Board. So just uh, that's a, we'll, we'll, maybe we'll circle back to that at some point. Um, any other questions for Susan Barrett or Lori Perry? Okay, well, there are a thousand more questions. You're not escaping that easily. Uh, but uh, thank you. Thanks both. Don't go away. Um, but Devin Green is here from Vaz and Devin, you have sent us um, some information. Why don't you go right ahead? Great. Thank you. Devin Green from the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. And I want to make sure that you're seeing my Word document. Okay, great. And just my word document. <laughs> okay. Beautiful. Um, we we can see on our screen. We see half of what you have. It goes down. Uh, yes. Yep. And then the I'll the graph on. is down below. Okay. Got it. Okay. Great. Thanks. So, um, I would be remiss if I didn't take you all to the sort of ground level to give you a sense of where we are with COVID and what hospitals have been doing and how we've gotten to this place. So I just wanted to highlight 
um, over this past year, the, the COVID hospital care for communities and everything that had to be done there, the hospitals were an integral part to the care uh, during the COVID crisis. And what they were doing was they were creating capacity for negative pressure rooms, they were building spaces in their hospitals, they were redeploying staff, um, they opened new treatment areas, they invested in screening devices, uh, they had labs investing in testing equipment and testing supplies. They test staff and patients on a regular basis. <clears throat> they stood up new monoclonal antibody infusion units, so whole new units um, to provide that outpatient uh, treatment for folks so that they wouldn't need hospital care. Um, and they prepared for and managed surges of COVID positive patients, including assisting nursing homes. So that was the, the hospital response in terms of caring for their patients. But in addition to that, there was also a major public health partnership with hospitals um, throughout Vermont. And I think that really contributed to Vermont's success, but they, assisted the state with the supply chain for PPE and testing supplies. I don't know if folks remember, but at the beginning of the pandemic, we had maybe a few days of testing supplies before we were going to run out. And the University of Vermont Medical Center came in and helped um, procure more testing supplies. They partnered on community testing. So those CIC sites that folks go to, a lot of those are staffed by hospital staff. Um, they set up vaccination clinics for their communities as well. So they started with the vaccination process, which was not how it was done in other states necessarily. Some other states had their Department of Health starting it with the 1A population. The hospitals uh, stepped up and jumped right into the vaccination process, which was not easy. Um, but they made it look pretty easy. Um, this has all been fairly seamless. It's all gone really well, um, but it's certainly come at a cost. So right now with the hospitals, um, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, it's unclear what patient volumes will look like in the future. Workforce, um, as I've heard talked about previously, uh, and I appreciate that, it's stretched to the absolute limit. Um, Healthcare employees have been working beyond their FTE for a year. Uh, there's no way to recruit new employees right now, um, and we are dealing with very high temporary staffing costs. Um, so workforce is really an issue. Uh, we also have the uncertainty of COVID-19 variants out there and what their effects may be. Um, and deferred healthcare too. We've heard from our emergency departments that they're seeing an increase in people in more severe mental health crisis or more severe physical crisis. Um, and, and they're coming into emergency departments later so that it, it merits a, a larger response, which is taking up resources. Um, when the Green Mountain Care Board talked about this margin that you see at the bottom here, where we're at 3.2, one nine million, um, that does take into account 180 million in the federal COVID-19 relief funds. So that goes to the hospital's income statement. Um, and, and even with that, we have just a 3.2 million margin on a 2.4 billion statewide hospital system. So that gives us virtually nothing to reinvest into our hospital system. Um, what I hear now is I heard a very impassioned plea from our chief medical officers on Monday that they need breathing room. Um, they are feeling like they have stepped up. Their hospitals have turned on a dime, provided services when needed, have procured testing supplies and uh, testing platforms as needed. They've um, done what they can to respond to this pandemic, but they do feel constricted by the current growth rate um, of the Green Mountain Care Board. So a growth rate of 3.5% does not meet the inflationary challenges of workforce, pharmacy inflation, 
um, investing in infrastructure and new technology. Um, when I talked to our chief medical officers, they were saying, you know, if you don't invest in new technology now, uh, the way advancements are happening and innovation is happening, you basically lose three years in advancement because it's just all happening so quickly in the medical industry. So what we're really looking for is, you know, the Green Mountain Care Board has responded to us. They have been flexible. We appreciate that. But we still really need to be able to have some flexibility with that margin um, so that we can reinvest um, make sure that we're still, we have that room to have our emergency response and preparedness. Um, we can reinvest in our aging facilities and also the latest technology and healthcare reform. So that's where we are. We have been, you know, as Lori pointed out, which I was glad she did, there's, we're not asking for no regulation. We're reporting monthly. Um, we've been working very closely with the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, but we are at a unique point, um, which you see at the bottom there, where we are getting dangerously close to not having any breathing room, not being able to have the resources to have the response that we need. And so we are looking for flexibility in that growth rate and in, um, in that growth rate to at least get up to medical inflation um, so that we have a little more room to reinvest in our hospitals. and to care for our communities. Okay, why don't you um, unshare and so we can ask questions. So when we're looking, when you're talking about a 3.5% growth rate, is that the growth rate that has been utilized in the budget process over the past um, uh, several years by the board? It's changed. I'll let the board respond, but typically it's it's lower than that. I say three and a half because that is what they are looking at today is the three to three and a half percent. Um, and so that's that's why I'm saying that today. Okay, and and so Susan, just uh, just so for the so the committee understands what that growth rate percentage means. Sure. So. Um, I think Devin is referring to the net patient revenue growth rate, um, and that has varied. Um, the board initially had a target back when the board took over hospital budgets of, I believe, 3.8%, and then it went down year over year. Um, and it has hovered near that, but as Devin said, it has fluctuated. Um, the one um, thing about the net patient revenue growth rate is it's a, I'm gonna be careful with my words. It's it because we're deciding this now. I don't know if the team, if the other meeting has ended, um, but this was an option. There were several options on the table um, to have it as a ceiling, um, but traditionally, NPR targets are, if, if we used to say, jokingly, like, what if there was a pandemic or a flu pandemic and everyone ended up at the hospital? You'd blow through your N NPR target. So um, that is where enforcement comes in, which we likely will put aside again this year. Again, it hasn't been decided yet, but we, we do monitor, um, as Lori pointed out, monthly. Um, we recognize that we are in a very unique time, um, and I can't speak for the board per se. We, we will see where they end up, but I know there are varying views from board members on this issue. I don't well, know if I really answered your question, but... Well, no, you did. You, you gave us some insight into the thinking around that, so that's, that is helpful, and we understand the hospital uh, association's position on that. Um, I just want to say that. Oops, sorry. Go ahead. I was just no, going to say ahead. that historically, that growth rate has been eight um, percent, oh, and wow. so it's come down significantly from there. And you know, Susan was talking about the sweet spot, and I would just say eight percent clearly is not right. We've really reduced our expenses, uh, but you know, a three point two million margin on a two point four billion uh, industry is also not the right place we want to be. 
So we're not the regulatory agency here, but we are <laughs> no, no, gonna get us stuck in that position pretty quickly. But I think it's important for us to understand. It's also important for us to understand the work that you have done. And I very, very much appreciate the work that the hospitals have done. My hospital in particular has been uh, done outstanding, an outstanding job of supporting our long-term care facilities, our nursing homes when uh, in the beginning of the pandemic and, and then uh, establishing a vaccine clinics, a very large vaccine clinic in particular at the uh, Champlain Valley Fairgrounds. Um, so I, I think, and I, it has, I, I would just say this and I'll ask a couple questions, but it has been seamless I mean, nobody knew and nobody knows all the work that's gone on literally behind the scenes. So it's, it is extremely, very much appreciated. Um, and I, uh, but then the, the I, I have one little question. The antibody infusion, um, is how available is, is the antibody uh, for patients coming in? It's a pretty big deal. Yeah, that's a great question. And there's been, it's gone back and forth um, in terms of the effectiveness of it. And now with the variants that have come in, um, you know, I think we have at least five hospitals providing it, but we, I just got a notification this morning that said, um, stop doing Bamlanivimab and do this other cocktail and um, because of the variance and the effect on it. So it's, you know, new information every day. And, um, but there are at least five hospitals that are providing the monoclonal antibody cocktail. Amazing. All right. Um, so then I'm going to go to the, the question uh, that I've been asking right along. And that is now with the Knowing, of course, that the con hospital concerns right now are focused so much on the pandemic and moving out of the pandemic. But during our healthcare reform process, uh, hospitals have had an eye to expansion for care management, uh, supporting folks, uh, getting to community services. You did mention mental health issues and needs and how that is being handled, A, during the pandemic, and B, how you're going to be looking at it going forward. And, um, and, and just knowing that there is always a bottom line, but it's a bottom line for our DAs, our SSAs, and our primary care folks. So the thinking about that and the, the thinking about how that fits into your budget review, your regulatory review. Yeah, well, I think, as you can see, there's not a whole lot of room to put resources into the healthcare reform direction that we want to go. We think the pandemic more than ever has shown us the importance of moving in this direction in terms of um, the payment methodology and allowing uh, healthcare providers to stay in business. Um, obviously, you know, having greater primary care wouldn't necessarily have prevented COVID or anything like that, but there is a real mental health crisis brewing and we know that we're gonna have to put resources into there and into the community. I think member Holmes um, last week when you were uh, doing her confirmation hearing suggested maybe some federal funding that could go towards things like mental health and healthcare reform. Um, you know, Senator Lyons, about, I always harp on the federal funding that never came with our um, all-payer model effort. And so now would be a great time to invest in uh, those healthcare forms in that care management and in mental health. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, it's a big, it's a big issue. We get it. This Questions. is where Devin and I agree. <laughs> you. Let's start there. That's where we're going to begin. <laughs> uh, okay, committee questions. Um, we have a couple minutes left. Comments. Uh, you know, I just, I want to thank both the Green Mountain Care Board and Vaz for the work that you're doing during the pandemic. Um, 
it is always difficult for us when we hear from uh, any of our constituents, including our hospitals, about the um, the dire straits that they're in, and and the pandemic is has certainly taken hospitals to the brink. Um, uh, so, just just thank you for your work. Uh, we'll just leave it there, and um, we'll, we'll don't worry. We're we're coming back. We will be back to a lot of the information that we have here. I think that um, you know I'm. I'm one of these literalists. So when you talk about Goldilocks, it always takes me a while to get there. But I talk about the cap and the and the and the floor for the for the margin, and you talk about the comfortable chair. Uh, so I'm, <laughs> well, I'll go for the comfortable chair. Um, and so, but thank you. Well, I think I think we're we're good. I think we'll be good. We always end early, and this is another example of that. So. Thank you.